Well, we have reached our appointed hour, and we will begin this um, this webinar. And uh, I want to first introduce uh, myself, Joshua Landis. I am the director of the Center for Middle East Studies at the University of Oklahoma. And um, today we have the honor of speaking with Fauzia Karimi. But before introducing her, I want to thank Daniel Simon, the assistant director and editor in chief of World Literature Today. He invited me to lead this discussion, which is part of World Literature Today's Newstat Festival. And uh, Ms. Karimi is serving on the Newstat jury. Uh, I would also like to thank Marjan Sarafipur for helping to organize this seminar. Um, so let me just alert the audience that we will have questions from the audience uh, after about half an hour to 40 minutes of, um, of discussion with our speaker. And uh, I have, we have put this uh, such that you'll be able to ask the questions yourself. Um, it'd be helpful if you would write them into the Q&A section. If you see the Q&A section, you can click on that and put your questions in there. And I can ask you then to ask your question. And at the, you know, in the last uh, 30 minutes of this discussion, which is going to go on for an hour and 15 minutes to 15 after the, um, the next hour. And, uh, and that way we can all join in a discussion together because we're not a, a monstrous number of people. So we, we can we can exploit this rather intimate um, setting. Um, so let me introduce our main highlight. Fauzia Karimi was born in Kabul, Afghanistan. She emigrated to the US in 1980 with her father, her mother, and her four sisters. Her father was worked for the US Embassy in Kabul, but when the Soviet Union invaded the country in 1979, their friends began to disappear, and the country was no longer safe for them. Ms. Karimi has a background in studio art and biology. She received her MFA in creative writing from Mills College. Her work explores the correspondence between the written and the visual arts. Her illustrated debut novel, Above Us, The Milky Way, was published by Deep Vellum in April 2020, and she is a recipient, recipient of the Rana Jaffe Foundation Writers Award and has illustrated a number of books and lives in Denton, Texas. And um, without further ado, we might begin our discussion. And I would ask Fauzia if you would begin by reading two short sections that, that really are at the very beginning and will introduce us to what your writing's like, Airplane and Tidy Forces. Thank you for being with us too. Thank you so much, Dr. Landis. It's, um, it's such a pleasure to be with you all uh, this morning. Um, I will start with these two readings. Um, just a brief description uh, of the book itself. It is, um, it is a collection of memories of uh, dreams, of fairy tales, and of dirges for the dead. It is about this family of seven um, immigrating from Kabul to Southern California, although that's never mentioned in the book. They are uh, they're nameless in the book. The countries are nameless, um, but, uh, but it is very much my own story um, of my early childhood. I'm gonna begin with these two short pieces. The first is about this family of seven uh, leaving Kabul, and the second is about what they leave behind. <clears throat> when they left, this is, um, excuse me, this is called Airplane. When they left the old land, the sisters kissed their grandmother's spotted hands and did not pull away their faces from her moist, uneven breath. They hugged their many aunts, kissing three times their warm cheeks. They bowed the crowns of their heads to their many uncles' hands and lips, nodding respectfully as the uncles listed the do's and do nots. And they spoke timidly and in whispers with the cousins they knew as intimately as they did each other, 
avoiding their eyes and their questions, secretly holding the same unanswerable questions in their own minds. The flight of the stairs to the mouth of the waiting airplane was steep, the metal cold, and the lofty view it afforded them indifferent to their many questions. Why, where, how long, and what for? The sisters looked down silently, yet intently, at the gathered tribe who stood twelve long and three deep, in heels and in coats, lipsticked and combed, smiling awkwardly with relief or with confusion, collectively willing back tears. When waving goodbye from the platform at the top of the stairs to the neatly assembled relatives standing down below, the sisters did not neglect their own reflected images, five small girls dressed in clothes and wearing expressions identical to their own. The mirror sisters stood inside the terminal and looked back out onto the airstrip from behind 10-foot-high windows, not knowing to question, not understanding the airplane, the overpacked suitcases, the flowers in the departing sisters' arms. The sisters, leaving, waved and waved again from atop the stairs at the mouth of the airplane, blew kisses and shouted promises to the family who would remain and endure, shouted over the noise of the airplane's roaring engines and waved again from the belly of the airplane, their small faces plastered two and three to a small window. But the sisters behind the glass within the terminal stood with arms immobile, chins tilted, and did not know what to make of the strained assembly on the tarmac. Excuse me. Thank you. Now... Would you like me to read Tidy Forces or... Oh, yes. Yes, I'm sorry. I... Oh, no, that's okay. Um, so this next piece is Tidy Forces. How cleanly the visiting forces sever tongues at right angles, remove eyeballs whole, arrange extracted teeth and fingernails in order. How smartly the soldiers line the streets of the occupied city, rifles at their sides, standing tall in their smart matching uniforms with clear blue eyes, combed blonde hair, shining beneath polished helmets. How nimbly their colossal tanks maneuver through the narrow streets of the old city and effortlessly climb and descend its hills. And how smoothly the rich blood flows down those sloping streets. No neighborhood is too inaccessible, too remote for the humming vehicles of the visiting forces. No walls too high or doors too thick to dull the efficient knock of visitors who do not take no for an answer, irrespective of time of day or night. How neatly the visiting forces prepare the school children, the radio technicians, the hairdressers, the dentists, and the politicians. With great organization and proficiency, do they compel the people of the country to follow their program, to emulate their smart ways. And with such soft, quiet methods, do they dispose of those who will not. The capability with which they dig into the rocky soil of the arid land is wondrous. How tidily they cover the mass graves afterward, afterward. Not a limb protrudes, not a groan filters through. And those who insist, those who speak, are allowed to do so in orderly and suitable fashion. They are proficiently dismembered, packaged in compact boxes or sacks, and in a timely manner delivered home to their families, who hear them clearly upon arrival. How tidily the visiting forces prepare the country. Boy. Now you you left Afghanistan when you were very young, mm -hmm. and um, the book really bears that out in many ways because your process of remembering remembering things and putting together little little recollections it really follows this sort of childhood effort to 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 make sense of what's going on. Could, could you, um, why don't we read, well, how did that shape the way you've, you've really packaged this book, which is quite unique? Yeah, so memory um, is really the bulk of the contents of the book, but it also gives it its shape. Um, I think from a really young age, it's, it's just in my nature, I've always um, just observed and noted down. It was something that I 
just did naturally. But at the age of six, when the Soviets um, came to occupy Kabul, it, that went into hyperdrive. <laughs> this need to to set down memory, to to bear witness to everything that was going on around me. I think this is in part because as a child, you don't have volition, you don't have autonomy. Um, and at the age of six, I there wasn't a whole lot that I could do. And yet the need to to help in some way, to fight in some way, even um, this catastrophic event. At first, it was an event. It was, I, like I read in this piece, the lining of the streets of Kabul with, um, with foreigners, with people who looked nothing like us, these Soviet soldiers. Uh, I remember that moment very distinctly of, of driving through in a cab with my mother and looking at these people who just really looked terrifying because they all have their guns on, you know, over their shoulders, their rifles and uh, their helmets and uh, military clothing, which I, I'd seen before on television when, you know, the president had uh, on a holiday, for example, when they would when they would show uh, soldiers marching with those were Afghan soldiers. And it was never something I really thought about. But to see these foreign soldiers come and to know that the night before the city had been bombed and that something had shifted. Um, I really felt the need to collect this as well as everything going on around me. There was a lot of whispering. The adults didn't want the children to know what was going on. They themselves didn't really know what was going on, but I would listen. I would stop and sometimes even hide um, so I could gather what they were saying because I felt that this was important and this needed to be collected. Uh, and then we moved to the US and it continued. Uh, we weren't there seeing or hearing these things, but um, the stories came through, you know, in one fashion or another. My parents, I, I would say bi-weekly, they went to a funeral and these weren't funerals for people, for Afghans who had escaped to, to the United States. These were funerals for those who continued to die on a weekly basis. So I collected those memories. Um, there were a few in particular from Afghanistan that I've always held very closely. And so I think when I started to write, I wasn't, I thought I was gonna write about my family, um, nothing about the war, but it just sort of just took a life of its own on. And, um, and it really became a book about the losses and the dead in Afghanistan. And in terms of um, the form of the book, memory really dictates that too, because memory is not this continuous stream. You know, it's these moments that rise up and sort of take over your head and perhaps your body too. I think memory is a very, um, it, it affects every, everything, <laughs> not just your vision. You're not just visualizing something, but you can sense uh, on many levels. So memory happens in these little pockets that rise and recede. And, and the book is like that. Some of the pieces are really short. Some are, uh, are much longer because we tend to stay with certain memories and sort of travel through them and that space expands. Um, and then the photographs that are in there, they're, they're all old family photographs. So again, memory. Um, yeah, when I was little, we, we had this box of photos and a couple of albums. And it's, I would say it's the biggest legacy we escaped with. We came with a few rugs, those were really important. <laughs> um, some china, and then these photographs, which were so important because a lot of Afghans didn't come with those things. So they'd see our photographs and say, wow, you brought photographs. But you know, the, I think at the time they were taken, they were just photographs of day-to-day -day things. But when you are in exile, uh, these photographs from a time that's been buried otherwise under underneath years of war, they, they really take on a significance. So those photographs, some of them are in the book. Right. Now your, your book is, has, it's full of joy and 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 fun, as particularly mm -hmm. in the episodes with your sisters and yeah. and family in the United States. But as you say, it, it is largely about the loss, and um, and fighting uh, uh, against, I guess, the realities that are going on uh, in Afghanistan. Could you read us one more passage, "The Dead," and that, which has to do with loss and and in a sort of in a sense a memorial for all the people that you left behind. I, I suppose it's a, it's a bit of survivor's guilt to a certain extent. Um, I maybe asked the wrong term to use, but that anxiety about all the people that you left behind. Yeah, no, no, that, that is definitely an element, the survivor's guilt. 
Um, so just one thing to say quickly about the book it is um, it's made up of these few hundred uh, episodic pieces based on memory, dreams, fairy tales. Um, but what gives the book um, sort of its uh, backbone, I would say, uh, is the alphabet. The book is an abecedarium. And um, so I'm going to read uh, the letter D. <clears throat> D, the dead. And there are many that will file through this book. They are loved ones, family, friends, and some are strangers. They are comfortable here, perhaps not uninvited. I was born into a culture whose first law is hospitality. I've observed this, this trait in members of my family near and distant. We all open the door, set out the tea, live with the dead. My father's family was modestly sized next to my mother's burgeoning clan of city dwellers. The, su the suffering on both sides was tremendous, but in my father's family, but in my father's small family of farmers, the losses seem remarkable. His family was cleaved and then cleaved again to an excessive degree and in brutal ways by the war. My aunt, my father's only sister, had five children and lost all five in one or another manner. My father lost all three of his brothers. It is strange whether chance or fate that his own life was not taken. In the beginning, when the forces first arrived, disappearances were common. My father would have been labeled as extremely dangerous to the new and occupying government he worked for. He worked after all for the embassy of their foremost enemy. And his friends, his co-workers, those he, he was acquainted with and those he cherished were picked up one by one, imprisoned, tortured, murdered. The week after we left the country, my father's name was read off a list of en enemy sympathizers. He was one of many who needed to be brought in in silence. If they knew my father, they would have known he is silent by nature and would not harm the smallest of creatures. They would, have, they would know he thinks of family and land, but little of politics. When they came to silence him, we were already gone. They missed us, but just. We did not leave intact. The knowledge of death, the wisdom you gain from the understanding that a beloved uncle is tortured, then buried alive, a cousin decapitated, that women are raped, have their fingernails pulled out, their breasts cut off. This wisdom you carry with you across borders and over the years of your life. This wisdom circles the nuclei within your cells and ensures you metabolize all suffering, great and small. And this wisdom reshapes the young in ways unknowable to those fully grown. This knowledge remakes the children into something else. Yes, it was strange to arrive in a peaceful land, to share a classroom in a schoolyard with children who still had their innocence and peered out through a single pair of eyes. <clears throat> Excuse me. For our lids opened and closed as theirs did, but revealed intermittently different sets of eyes. We could stand at once in a desolate cityscape surrounded by tanks and headstones and on a school playground filled with a din of laughter and bouncing balls, skipping children. I remember seeing my sisters across that schoolyard and seeing them apart, unnatural among the other children. And when in passing, we were close enough to catch each other's eyes, the cognition was both sweet and painful. We had come from a place no one knew existed, from a reality we could not explain to anyone. And we had seen and known things we dared not utter to those around us. They reshape and redefine you, the dead. They cast their pal over you, draw the pink from your cheek or color it in your lips a too deep crimson. And they hold your hand while you skip, climb and jump rope. They are loved ones and there are others I don't recognize. The man who carries a book half torn, he comes and goes silently. But I do not know who he is, what he is, what it is he wishes to communicate, if anything. He isn't in a hurry and seems content to be dispossessed, unbound to land or time. He simply comes and goes over the days of my life, as do the other war dead, carrying the half of a book, a book he never opens, but which seems an extension of himself and the hand that clutches it as if it is his blood that circulates up and down the spine of the book, 
in his thoughts that make its pages flutter. The dead are many and pass through and reside in books comfortably. Perhaps it is in books they find solace and home. They move through this one and some may stop a moment to gaze up at you. Do not avert your eyes. Boy. Now, let us turn um, to your artwork. Um, I, I would love it if you would show us, if you would put up your screen and walk us through some of the, some of the marvelous artwork that, that um, really peppers the story and gives us a, a third dimension to this book. Of course. Book. Um, so this is uh, the cover, obviously. Um, the book is a love letter to my family, to Afghanistan, to the dead, and, um, and to the cosmos. So on the cover, you have um, our planet, the Earth, and behind it, the sun, the moon, at the bottom right, and the Milky Way wrapping around it. Here's the back. Um, as I said, the book is made up of a, a few hundred episodic pieces. Um, 26 of those pieces are alphabet pieces. Uh, here is the letter C. And um, the book has both photographs from my childhood, um, but it also has uh, original watercolor paintings that are based mostly on, um, um, well, both Eastern and Western medieval illuminated manuscripts. So here in letter C, it's, it, this piece is all about color, about life before the war, uh, how it was filled with color. In the photograph, you see my mother and my oldest sister on um, these poppy covered hills that in the springtime, Afghans um, would go to these hills out in the countryside and picnic uh, in the springtime. It was a big day of celebration. Here in the letter Q is um, a piece um, was based on, on how there isn't a whole lot to explain war. Uh, what is it, what does it do? It's, it, I don't know, it, I think you can question it again and again, um, but as the writer, how, how little help I am. And the, um, the image is, uh, is the whale of war, which comes up in, in areas in the book um, and it, you know this mythical bird carrying the head of um, actually in this case my cousin's head he was beheaded um, and he he screams out what war is and we don't understand we hear it and yet um, yeah it's just a whale it's a song of, of war oh here's the letter s with um I guess a cosmonaut, this is a sort of self-portrait of, uh, of just being something like an astronaut up above the earth, having great love for this planet and great love for what is above and in trying to understand uh, what war, what just suffering in general is on this planet. I, I think we tend often to look up to the sky for answers. This is a piece about my mother um, this is a photograph of her from when she was a teenager. She was a great lover of uh, Indian cinema. So, so she would go see these Hindi films in, um, in the city center. Her father, who is actually, uh, my grandparents are Uzbeki and Tajik. They left Central Asia for Afghanistan uh, because of war that arrived to their countries. So her father was... Um, he was Muslim, but he wasn't very strict at all. So he would send his girls to the movie theater to go shopping and they would go in their mini skirts and their beehive hair. And um, this is a piece about her watching Hindi movies. Here um, I'm using the image actually over the text. It's a piece about immigration of um, actually of not of the living immigrants like we were, but of the dead who they don't, stay in the places where they are um, violently killed, they cross borders, they travel. So they're traveling over the text here. 
this is very directly from uh, biblical illuminated manuscripts. This is Hellmouth, a character you often see in those old Bibles. And usually in those Bibles, you have, um, you have demons coming out, pulling in the sinful into the mouth of hell, uh, down to its bowels. And in my book, Hellmouth represents the Soviet torture chamber where, um, where we lost people who were taken in and never came out. Those who did were, were very much changed after the experience. This is, um, this is the dead, the many dead who, um, this particular image shows, uh, shows a dead boy who is wrapped in the traditional um, Islamic wrappings, uh, but sainted here because uh, I felt strongly when I was writing this book that, that something had to be done for these people who, innocent people who just lost their lives and this need that I had to sort of sanctify and anoint them in some way, um, not as saints or prophets or anything, but just of simple people who lost their lives senselessly. This is a photograph of um, my father on the right and his two of his friends uh, during his college years. Um, the man in the middle was his best friend and someone I remember very clearly, just a wonderful, wonderful human being who always brought us gifts as kids. And really he was a part of the family, but he, um, he was an engineer and on his way along with four other engineers to, um, to a school site. This is in the first year of the war in 1979. Um, he and the other four were picked up and they were hacked to pieces and left on the side of the road. And um, this is very sad. But uh, the way that he was recognized was that his brother was a doctor in the city hospital. So when they brought these body parts back, someone came to his brother and said, there is, um, there is a head that looks like you. So that's how he was identified. And this happened um, the day before he was meant to get married. This, uh, this actually goes with the piece, The Dead, that I wrote um, and read just a few minutes ago. This is that, the image that goes with that piece. So um, my cousin who was beheaded, there's a piece about him in the book called The Suit. And uh, he was actually killed by the religious police who uh, in the early years of the war as a way to fight the Soviets, um, you know, these different Mujahideen groups would come together and they, uh, I think one of the ways they thought they could bring people together was around the religion. And so they went around telling people how to dress and, you know, not to become Europeanized through the Soviets and uh, the city people. This is actually an image of my father living uh, when he was young in his village. But the piece about my cousin um, always reminded me of my dad. My dad was one of these people. He, he left his village at a really young age to go get an education. And... Um, and that was very rare at the time. He, he actually ran away from home at the age of 15 to do that on his own. And his nephew years later, I think, had similar inclinations. Um, and one day he was walking down the village road and these men of God told him that he was not allowed to wear a suit, that he needed to grow a beard. Uh, he did not listen. The next time they saw him, they, they cut off his head and uh, threw it into his mother's courtyard. This is him. And this is uh, his brother who was a taxi driver in Kabul. The book really is, I, I, I would say he's at the heart of the book and maybe the impetus for writing the book in the first place, though, though I'm not sure I knew about that when I started writing it, but, um, but he's very much at the heart of it. He's someone I remember very clearly. I thought of him as an uncle because he was so much older. He was in his early twenties and um, he was picked up. Uh, well, he picked up a fare as a taxi driver and it must've been an informant. There are many of those in that first year, um, 1979. And uh, they picked him up and he disappeared. We didn't know what happened to him. My parents and his wife went searching for him for days and finally learned that he'd been imprisoned and as a political prisoner, you know, there's no reason why someone like him 
had anything to do with politics. He was a cab driver. So he was picked up and, um, and taken in. And uh, they tried for a long time to gain his release and heard at one point that they were releasing prisoners from that prison, that you had to arrive early to pick up your person. So I remember this day very clearly. Again, I was six and um, I remember being at his house. We waited at his house while his wife and my parents left to go um, bring him home after he was released. They didn't know much. They just knew prisoners were going to be released. So I remember that day sitting on the floor in his house and life just moving about me um, and thinking about one thing, about having him back and being excited and yet really anxious. And the hours went by and the morning turned to afternoon and to night and it was dark and after dark, my parents came home without him because they had not released him, but they had um, gotten a little bit of information from one of the other prisoners who were released and they said he'd been tortured and then buried alive. So this painting is again, a way to sanctify the dead uh, this is a tradition in early Islamic uh, illuminated manuscripts where the saints and the prophet would have this veil over their faces, uh, a white veil. I've given him a, a black veil, again, uh, as a way to, to anoint the innocent war dead. I think you're on, on mute, um, Dr. Landis. Well, um, boy. In, you went back to Afghanistan in uh, 2015 and you were able to f see some, you were able to meet members of your family who are still there describe your your trip back and how what that evoked in you yeah um I mean, it was an emotional trip on many levels I, I hadn't been back since leaving at the age of seven i left on my seventh birthday and went back um 35 years later and um it was hard initially because the reason we went back um, my mother had passed away the year before and we went back on the first anniversary of, of her passing to, um, to see her sisters who were still living at the time and, um, and to commemorate her passing with them in Afghanistan. And there was this brief window or so we thought <laughs> where it was safe to travel back. And uh, just weeks before we left um, the airport in, um, I think in, I believe it was in Kandahar was taken over by the Taliban and a lot of parts of the country were being taken over um, including my dad's village, actually. So what happened in 2015 is very similar to what happened recently. The Taliban were making inroads and taking over large swaths of the country and coming towards Kabul. So before leaving the State Department, um, when I called them about, you know, what can we do in terms of safety? Uh, uh, they said, you shouldn't go. <laughs> Absolutely not. This is not a good time to be traveling. They'd had a lot of intelligence saying that there was going to be worse to come in Kabul itself. But um, you know, we didn't know, was, was it completely gonna shut down? Was this gonna be the only chance to travel back? So we went, my father, two of my two younger sisters and I, and, um, and it was wonderful to see family, um, people, some whom I'd never met and they were born after we left, others that I remembered clearly from childhood, but it was just devastating. I mean, seeing these people who had lived, you know, at that point, um, with 35 years of war. Some of them had escaped to Pakistan, some to India, uh, some to Iran, but they'd, they'd all come back once the Taliban fell in 2001. So they'd been trying to make their lives and for these 15 years, um, they did, they'd done fairly well considering, you know, they're not wealthy people, uh, but they were getting by and some of the young women were uh, working for NGOs and um, getting degrees in college, the the boys too. At the same time, there's just this dread, this constant dread, because while we were there, there were bombings and um, there was a massive earthquake as well, which when it happened, we thought it was another bombing. And um, there's, there's just this feeling, this constant feeling of anything could happen at any moment. 
a person can walk out the door and not come home. And, you know, this is one of the more peaceful periods in Afghanistan's recent history, but it was, um, it was just really, really sad to see it. But again, comparing my life to theirs, how can you not, you know, that guilt is there. I have this very peaceful life in the United States. Uh, and even though I always have the dead with me, um, to live through that is an entirely different thing. And I saw it in their faces and their bodies, uh, their livelihoods, uh, you know, food was scarce. Again, this is Kabul. I think it's much worse in the villages and we didn't make it out to the villages. Kabul just got shut down during that period. Um, there were roadblocks everywhere because of, again, the intelligence that there, there were gonna be um, bombings. So, to think now that it's even worse than it was in 2015 when I was there and that these relatives are now, you know, continue to be caught in the midst of it. Um, many of them have lost their jobs. Uh, one was actually a journalist and um, he managed to leave the country just days before, thankfully, but, uh, but everybody else is, is stuck there. <laughs> and we have no idea what's going to happen from here on out. No, we don't. And, and, uh, you know, o OU is trying to bring 10, um, 10 Afghan uh, scholars to the OU campus. And it's a very difficult process because yeah. many of them who fled the country um, can't get to American consulates. And the American consulate isn't processing papers for people outside the country. They're trying to deal with the, the, the big number of Afghans that they hurried out in those last days and took to refugee camps. And one of those just stood, uh, Shabnam Khaliliar, who, who is on her way, just arrived in New Jersey and is now being processed at Fort Dix. But um, we hope she'll be able to join us soon. But th that brings us to, to this really, this present episode. And I would, uh, you know, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't try to bring you up to give us some, some thoughts about, you know, in a sense, our, our newspapers are filled with two different narratives. One is the, you know, the, the terrible heartbreak of watching the Taliban overtake Kabul and the country and everything that America worked for and the elites that it, it um, attached itself to and it, who, who, who attached themselves to the United States, like your father did, are going to be brought low by this. But on the other hand, there's a, the other story, which is perhaps this will bring some relief, particularly in the countryside where the fighting has been so intense and, uh, and the Taliban has been able to unite the country in a way. And perhaps there's some hope for, uh, for, for some stability and, and the end of war, which we couldn't see the end of as mm -hmm. long as America was there. How do you, how do you process this? Um, as you watch this, how, how have the thoughts gone through your own mind as you've seen this whole, uh, you know, this, this newest regime change uh, tear through Afghanistan? Um, I think, like everyone else, I've been devastated. Uh, when, when the Taliban took Kabul, those images that came out, it's just heartbreaking. Um, I think I especially feel with the women and girls of the country uh, who had made some advances, uh, but I think those are all lost now. Whatever the Taliban promises, I you know, there's we can't really rely on on their words. We've seen that before. Um, it's a really complicated situation. I think it's why it took the United States 20 years to try to do something about it, and and in the end, not be able to. Um, it's complicated because you have different groups in Afghanistan. You have those living in the cities and those living in, in the villages in the countryside. Um, there are different types of people. There are the different ethnicities. Um, there's Pakistan very much involved and has been all this time helping the Taliban. Uh, so, and then Iran on the other side, you know, there's, there's interest in the region and then, uh, Europe, I think, wants to, to help in some way. I'm not sure what they can do. They're closer, though. And then uh, and the efforts the United States has made, which um, it helped some. It helped those in the cities. But in 
the villages. You know, the United States killed many, many innocent people with drone attacks. Uh, I've even heard stories about torture by the Americans. You know, I don't know um, what to think of those. It's what the villagers themselves say. So, you know, stories like this that, that don't get documented, there aren't journalists out there speaking to these people. And uh, from what I hear, the villagers are happy to have the United States gone because uh, they were living in this constant state of fear for those 20 years. Uh, they couldn't go anywhere. There, there are families who didn't see each other for a couple of decades because travel was so um, uh, perilous you know, to get from one part of the country to another, not that far away. So I've heard stories about families finally seeing each other now that the Americans are gone. And yet again, in the cities, um, people are being taken in, journalists are being tortured, uh, killed. Uh, and, uh, and those who helped the United States, many of them are still caught there. And these aren't, um, I would like to say that they're not necessarily the elites. These are very normal people who were lucky enough to get these jobs. And my father too, he wasn't one of the elite who managed to get away. He just very luckily happened to have a job at the US embassy. Um, and it was with the embassy's help, but also with my mother bribing officials to get documents uh, stamped. It was just a, a series of, of things that happened that um, I thought really just seem more lucky than anything um, that we got out when so many couldn't. So um, yeah, most of these people who were stuck, they, they aren't th those elites who got out with their private airplanes and um, had tons of money in Dubai and home second homes. These aren't the ones who took all the money that, that the United States put into the country. Um, I, I saw them with my own eyes when we were driving around Kabul in 2015. Uh, these people would drive around in these huge Hummers and hanging off all four corners of the car because traffic's not very fast in Kabul. It's very congested men with rifles on their shoulders, just really terrorizing the people around them. And these are the people with the money who worked in government. So there's the corruption, uh, years and years of corruption of, of money taken by individuals for their own needs, rather than sent out to the villages to build schools or, um, or to help, you know, women advance in any way. It, there's just so many factors that go into it. It's a very complicated situation. Um, as far as hope for the future, I mean, you have to have it, right? <laughs> Even after these 40 years of seeing one terrible chapter after another, um, an endless war and knowing of the suffering and pain of, of people in that country, you have no choice but to have hope for that part of the world. And I, my hope is that the Taliban will come through on some of these promises, but the economy is, you know, in free fall. So uh, will they actually manage to do it? They're very good at terrorizing and, um, and destruction. Are they any good at governance? You know, who, who knows? Right. Well, thank you for that. Let's, let's turn to our audience now, and we're going to, um, allow people to speak themselves. And this is the first time I've done it. So it, it'll be a little bit of an, an experiment mm -hmm. um, in how to uh, allow people to the microphone. But we have allowed you to talk. If you would raise your hand, there's a raise hand thing. I can, I think, allow you to talk. And, um, and uh, okay, Alexander Jabari, who is my esteemed colleague, um, we ask you to unmute. He Can you hear me? Persian literature. Yes, Alexander. Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you for um, sharing with us from your book and for your talk. In addition to the horrors of, of war and, and violence that you were speaking of, I was struck with when you were giving us readings from the book and, and sharing images from the book, how there also seemed to be a, a kind of recurring theme of, of wonder and strangeness. Um, I'm, I wondered, um, first of all, if you would, if you would agree that this is um, this was a, a theme in, in the work, and if so, how much of this was about how how you've made sense of your own experience? How much of this was about how the reader should relate to the material? I, I kind of wanted to invite you to to speak a little bit to that theme of wonder. 
Yeah, I'm I'm actually surprised you caught that in those pieces that I read because there's some of the darker pieces, but but there is a, a great deal of wonder and joy in the book. Um, and that comes from my love for fairy tales. Um, it comes from my love for for the planet and for the stars. Really, I just, uh, you know, in addition to um, carrying these stories with me my whole life, I've always been deeply, deeply inspired by uh, the natural world around me. Um, and just, I, I find wonder everywhere, whether it's in literature or in the stars or, um, or in relationships, the sisters in the book, they, they share a lot of joy and wonder as children. Um, I think often we think wonder is this thing that has to have its own place. And usually it's uh, the place for children and, um, and story, like stories for children, but wonder it's, I mean, we, we all know it, you know, and I, I think it's important to, um, to continue to go there as adults to, to find beauty in the world, because otherwise, what are we left with, you know? And in this moment, especially um, in the United States, there's so much focus on the negative uh, that I think we, I don't know, we, we really lose something precious when we leave something like wonder behind or we leave something like joy behind. Um, so that there's a lot of that in the book uh, because I think it's important. Indeed. Um, Alexander, a follow-up? Uh, sure. I, it's just, you know, it was especially in the images that I was getting this as you were talking about how you were drawing from the kind of manuscript tradition and, and there is such a rich tradition of the, um, you know, Ajay of Name, the Ajay uh, Ajayabul Makhluqat, these kind of manuscript works that are, that are all about evoking that um, that sense of wonder. I, I love how you put it right now, um, because I, I think you're, you're absolutely right, or I would agree with you that it, it also doesn't have to be something uh, positive. Mm -hmm. um, we can, we can react, I think, to, um, to the painful things in, uh, in life, not only with, uh, with grief, but with, with wonder at, at the, the kind of the possibilities that they engender. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to reading your book. Thank you. I, I really, I love your thoughts as well. I, I share them. <laughs> Thank you, Alexander. Um, John Thompson has a question for you. Um, John, would you like to ask that live? Let's see if I need to. Where have you gone, John? Tom there you are up there. Let me uh, ask to unmute. Okay, you need to unmute yourself, John. Are you there? Um, I'm down here. Am I unmuted? You're, you're, you're good. Oh, okay. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Oklahoma City is a lot of, there's going to be several hundred uh, refugees from Afghanistan coming to the metro area. And the Oklahoma City Public Schools are, are going to get a lot of, of the, them. And um, I put a link to um, an article in the newspaper. Mary Mellon is a great, great leader. And I was just wondering if they should be hooking up with both of your, you and the OU Center here. And um, with field trips and uh, as whenever it's appropriate, and so they can get some guidance on um, their transition, and the school system and the uh, other uh, volunteers get guidance. Well, John, let me let me jump in here and, and say that OU is is um, is um, has been working. Our, our dean at the College of International Studies, uh, mm -hmm. Scott Fritzen, has been spearheading an effort to 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 get in touch with Catholic Relief and the other organ state organizations, which are helping the 1,800 uh, refugees that are on their way to Oklahoma to get them, um, you know, language training for foreign. We have a big center for language training uh, in our college um, for foreign students and so forth. And so we're, we're trying to network and do as much as we possibly can to help the larger state effort. And I think there are a lot of, uh, new NGOs that are popping up to, to, to embrace this. 
Yeah, it's and very hard I, to, I would yeah. love to help however I can. Thank well, you, John. Uh, yeah, thank you. Very good. Um, right. If there's, you know, just raise your hand if you want to, um, if you want to ask a question and then I'll be able to see you. Now, tell us, let me, let me ask you about your sisters because much of this, uh, much of your book is really the joy of being a family and exploring um, America and, and mm -hmm. finding a new world here. And you, both your parents are so dynamic and your mother in particular is, um, is clearly, you know, not only did she figure out how to get you out of the country yeah. and, and to bribe this little scribe at the, at the uh, entrance way to the visa place. And, and she just, she just understood that, um, how to get the family ahead and put it together and keep it in one piece. Um, and clearly that family has been, you know, at the heart and soul of, of everything that you, that, uh, so tell us a little, what's, what's happened to your, uh, to your sisters? Um, well, we are all over the U S right now, actually, uh, when we moved back to LA, so the three of them are in, um, Southern California still after having uh, a couple of them having lived elsewhere in the United States. Um, one is in Washington state and I'm out here. Uh, my dad uh, lived in Las Vegas for a number of years. After my mom passed, he, he moved back to California. So most of them are there in Southern California again. And um, yeah, it's, you know, like maybe it came through in the book. I, I hope it did, but I come from a family of very creative people. Um, not necessarily. How are they able, to, are they able uh -huh. to rebuild their lives in America so quickly? I mean, so successfully. Yeah, they, they didn't have much of a choice. I mean, you, you know, you come here and you have to um, make it work. But but I think my parents were just really um, special individuals, really hardworking. I mean, my dad grew up on a farm in Afghanistan, so from a very young age, he was up, you know, before dawn, and uh, and then would fall asleep, uh, you know, after dinner, just exhausted from working the fields from a young age. And then, um, like I said, he, he ran away from home to get an education and put himself through school and got, you know, he worked with the Germans for a little while, worked at the embassy. Um, my mom in Afghanistan at the time, most women, you know, you were free in a lot of ways, but most women didn't work outside the home. Um, she was a parent, but uh, we came here and she just bloomed and blossomed, uh, you know, got a job right away, didn't speak the language, went to night school. My dad spoke English, um, but they just started doing, started working and they didn't have uh, especially um, high paying jobs. We lived on two minimum wage jobs, five kids. They just worked really hard and, and also um, had these really big open hearts so that the Afghan community, as it started to build in the LA area, grew and grew, and they were very much part of that. Um, yeah, it's it was an interesting childhood because we had the the American childhood. You know, I'm very much a part of that. Um, television, books, all all of that, and at the same time, we had this other life. So it was two lives lived simultaneously, which was really wonderful and uh, and rich. The um, big parties we went to, sadly, the many funerals that took place, uh, you know, weddings happen, all, all the things Afghans would do in Afghanistan, they continue to do here. The, um, oh, we've just got a nice question. Um, Hushang Noor, would you answer, would you ask your question um, live? Oh, there you go. Oh, hi, this, this is Hu Shang. Thank you for this conversation. Uh, Ms. Karimi and uh, Dr. Landis, I appreciate it. Uh, I'm actually hanging onto my wheelchair and walking. As you know, I had a surgery and kind of 
listening and uh, learning and hoping to pitch in a little bit. Uh, I uh, teach English free of charge to Iranians and other Farsi speakers uh, on my Instagram and Telegram page. Uh, and it's uh, easily accessible to anybody who wants to learn English. So if any of the newcomers, refugees, uh, uh, the, the, regardless of what level of English they have, uh, they can utilize that and uh, learn, uh, begin learning this language. So just wanted to uh, let the audience, uh, as well as you know, uh, that uh, I've been teaching for four years uh, and I teach in Farsi. So uh, as long as uh, they know a little bit of Farsi, the rest is, uh, should be a piece of cake. Thank you, Mr. Noor. Thank um, you so much. Thank you. All right. Um, how did you how did you decide to become an artist and not to go biology, become a doctor <laughs> or do something that most first generation Americans uh, do in order to in order to get ahead in this capitalist world? Um, I, I don't think I can speak for all Afghans, but but I think it generally holds true that um, Afghan Asians are, are a bit different than um, some of the other Asian immigrant communities that come here. Education is not um, is not primary, uh, I should say, it's, it, because Afghans are so social. Uh, all having those um, attributes are much more important. So, in my family, for example, it was much more important to be able to um to serve guests to be able to speak it reminds me of of um jane austen novels that the, there's there's just this really beautiful and many layered um quality and and discussion that happens so so you're taught to do those things which i was never very good at i was very shy um my older sisters were much better at that and i would get pulled away from homework all the time to come and cook or help out with something. Um, yeah, so education, th that was my own thing. I, I very much wanted um, to, it, it was more than I just have a real lust for learning. I, I, I'm very curious, I, I love um, many different things. And uh, and yeah, I, I had promised them that I would be a doctor. So they sort of, because I wanted to, um, they'd sort of looked to that as, as you know, something hopeful in their future and, and had this idea that I would become a doctor and go back to Afghanistan and, and help there. Uh, but around the age of 14, 15, I turned to the arts. Um, it just happened um, first with visual art. So I went to school to study, um, well, to study painting, but with stuff happening at the university I was at, a lot of the painting teachers were given early retirement. So I did photography and uh, ceramics. And then I, then I turned to biology and not biology in order to go to medical school, but biology in order to, to study botany, field botany, um, which again, all, a lot of the programs around the country were sh shutting down their field botany departments. It was going more towards um, lab work and pharmaceuticals and stuff. So made another shift and turned to writing. Uh, but I would say all of it makes its way into my writing. Now, in order to, um, to, to end up, I would love it if you would read us one more section from your book. I know we haven't sure. pre-planned this, so you may not. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm going to give you a few seconds to find uh, another passage. OK. Um, we'd love to hear one more. Um, let me see if I can find. Let's see. I'm trying to find something that's a bit lighter <laughs> so we can end on a lighter note. There's a lot. There's a lot of joy in the book, and there's there's a constant feeling of a young, of that that youthful sort of curiosity, as uh, Professor Jabari was saying, of the of the the joy yeah. of discovering things, and even in the saddest 
uh, recollections uh, when you're trying to process clearly these these moments of intense loss. There there is sort of a curiosity that um, and an innocence that that pervades uh, almost every one of these little vignettes. Yeah, and I th I think that's partly because I I wanted it seen through through the eyes of a child. Um, I mean, there are a lot of adult themes going on, but but I think the two can live side by side. Right. Um, so I'm going to read uh, this piece called uh, Conveyance, and um, I'll show you the image afterwards. <laughs> Conveyance. The sister, always flitting, skipping, sprinting, caught a glimpse of the cat in the corner of her eyes. She bounded diagonally across the yard from the scorching patio over the hissing sprinklers to the back gate up which she routinely liked to climb barefoot and over which she liked to keep an eye on the goings on in the alleyway the gate bordered. Having spotted the cat, she stopped before the gate and rather than climbing it, leapt again over the sprinklers in a, different, in a direction perpendicular to the fence to slide into the cool, dry shade under father's grape arbor. The cat, unperturbed, lay in a corner stretching out along the arbor's trellis. The sister sat cross-legged in front of it, so that the two met eye to eye. She looked over her shoulder and about her, across the expanse of lawn and toward the house. She and the cat were alone. The midday sun kept the others indoors. Mother's cooking on a Sunday drew them to her circle. The animated sister settled down and began to match her breath to the cat's idle, resonant purr, and tried to elongate her pupils to match the cat's vertical slits. The cat stared. The sister stared. The two respired in synchrony. The sun pushed its rays through the grape leaves onto the cat and the sister's fur and hair, warming them in patches. The sister and the cat gazed at one another. The sprinklers pattered softly across the lawn, rosebush, and patio in the distance. And then the girl fell, head first, into a slumber that was not a slumber into a world that was mirror image to her own world in all but one way. Here, the cat spoke in the sister's first tongue. Yes, the cat. In this world, very plainly spoke in the sister's birth tongue. And the cat asked the sister, do you truly enjoy running through and leaping over the odious wet sprinklers? To the cat, the sister looked happy enough her wild hair swinging across her shoulders, her flushed face revealing teeth and tongue, which released the intermittent whoop and roar as she bounded here and there. Or have your mother and sisters doled out the terrible punishment because you have misbehaved again? Have they discovered your collection of dead flies and beetles? The cat stared and waited for an answer. It was familiar with the family's ways, but didn't always comprehend them. The cat waited. The sister heard and here's an image of wow. there is it that's beautiful thank you thank you we've got a a comment by lubna mirza who's going to answer um who's going to speak to us now okay lubna you have to take yourself off mute You have to unmute yourself, Lubna. I guess it's a little difficult. Are you able to do that, Lubna? Ask to unmute. There you go. Um, anyway, I just want to, I, I, I will fill in because she's written her her comment here and she says that I volunteer for a Shiite clinic in Oklahoma City and I saw one man from Afghanistan who was there to ask for a, a work excuse because he had foot pain and he came back and talked to me about his wife and five children and said that she um, is unable to sleep if she would see the body parts and blood stuck on the walls as soon as she tried to close her eyes. There was a bomb blast in her neighborhood and she could not escape from these images and memories. 
and um, and Lubna commented how your talk about the dead, your chapter about the dead, um, you know, really struck, evoked this same kind of trauma yeah. um, of this Afghan that she spoke with. Yeah, when I've um, spoken to Afghans about writing the book or thinking about it earlier on, um, the one comment I would get again, again and again is, we all have these stories, this, you know, which I, I very much understand having grown up around it, but there's so much of this. It, and it's, um, I mean, I, th I think like any war, genocide, um, anything atrocious like this that happens historically, there's so much that is lost that we never know about or hear about. And I think it's really important um, to get some of it out there. I, I really hope that there are more Afghan writers who, who begin to write about these things, talk about these things. Well, uh, you know, on that, on that note, let us um, bring this wonderful webinar to a close. And I want to thank you uh, so much for being with us and, and really for introducing me to your book, which was such a joy. I, I began reading it and I couldn't stop. It was so full of creativity that the, the voice is so, um, so many perceptions that are clearly put in this childhood way, but they're so mature and, um, and, and make one constantly want to read more and more. There's, it's not a sad book, even though it seems like a very sad book. And it is a, a requiem for all of these dead that you've enumerated. Um, and of Afghanistan at large, but it, it's um, full of beauty, and it, it's so uh, imaginative in every way, and that and that the lovely Milky Way, which in a sense represents all those souls that have been lost in Afghanistan. Um, thank you so much for being with us, and thank World Literature Today. I thank World Literature Today for for uh, allowing me to participate in this wonderful festival. Thank you so much, Dr. Landis. It's it's been uh, a privilege and an honor to to be with you today. Thank you. Well, thank you. All right. And thank you to our audience. Um, very nice of you to join us. Till next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.